It's great to be with you guys. Let's get up for all the song leaders. And uh, do we have any football fans in the house? Uh, how about any Chief fans? Wow. No Mahomes fans, huh? How about the, the Eagles? And I, I'm, I'm talking about the ones that are in the playoffs. How about the Bengals? All right, do we have any Charger fans? Any Rams fans? How about the Lakers? All right, all right. how about the Warriors? <laughs> you know, it, it, it's pretty awesome. I was talking to uh, Jonathan Franklin today, and he was telling me about how, uh, I asked him, what do you do in the off season? And he goes, well, I, I'm trying to, he's basically trying to convert people to become fans of the team. And I go, well, I gotta imagine that LA is such a, a good sports market. He goes, no, it's super tough because there's so many sports teams to get fired up about. And he's, he's trying to, you know, steal away, you know, uh, fans from other teams and get them to really join the team over there with the Rams. And I go, you know, you know what's so amazing about sports is we get so fired up about sports. You know, people will pay $100 to go to an arena. They'll pay $20 for a bucket of popcorn. They'll pay $15 for a soda and to sit out there and scream for their team. And if we'll do that for our teams in the sports world, how much more fervent should we be to be in the kingdom, be on Team Jesus, and be able to hear God's word this morning? I mean, here's the thing. This is a, a participation sport. If I'm going to get up here and preach God's word to you, I, I just would call you. I would expect you as your brother to get excited about getting into the Bible and hearing God's word preached to you this morning. Amen. Hey, Amen. Well, let's turn over to Revelation chapter 14. That was, that was the, to set the mood right there. Let's look at Revelation chapter 14. And we're going to pick it up in verse 14. It says, I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was seated on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung the sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. You know, here, the only surviving apostle, the 12, writes in the book of Revelation the apocalyptic vision of Jesus' return. And it says that an angel comes out of the temple. And we know that the Old Testament temple was to foreshadow the church. That no longer would God live in this temple built by human hands, but now his Holy Spirit would reside in us. And now the people of God's true kingdom would be the true temple of God. And so here, the angel comes out of the church building, outside that door, and he screams up to heaven, he goes, Jesus, the harvest of the earth is ripe. And Jesus comes on the clouds of heaven. And he has a sickle in his hand. If you don't know what a sickle is, it's a gnarly farming tool. It would have been like a big shepherd's staff with a crescent blade at the end of it. And sometimes it would have two handles on it so you can really get leverage 
and swipe a whole stalk of corn or sugar cane. And that's what Jesus is coming on and with his hands as he's coming to harvest the earth. You know, here it quotes, it gives a very interesting name for Jesus. It says, one like the son of man. And you'll see there's a cliff note there that directs us to Daniel 7, verse 13. And Daniel 7, 13 says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before, before me was one like the Son of Man, coming on the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, sovereign power over all nations and people of every language, worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Why does it quote Daniel 7? Because it's trying to get us to see what this harvest is about. It's a harvest of men and women of every nation and language who would be true worshipers of God. They would worship in spirit and truth. And that's what Jesus is coming back one day for. A harvest of true worshipers, a harvest of the earth. This is what we're going to study out today. The harvest of the earth. So we understand from this scripture that the apocalypse is also going to be a harvest. You know, we're going to talk about three things that God is calling us so that we can have an incredible harvest. And my first point for you this morning is apocalypse now. Harvest right now. Let's look over here in Joel chapter 3. Give me an amen when you're there. You know, Joel 3, it, it, it gives us this, this incredible scripture, but it's right after Joel 2, verse 28, which is what is quoted in Acts 2 when it says that the kingdom would come and his spirit would rest on all types of people and they'd be men and women who are dreaming and having visions. So after that would happen and God's kingdom would be established, what would then be the message after that? Joel 3 and verse 9. It says, proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weakling say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nations on every side, and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance in the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come and trample the grapes, for the wine press is full. The vats are overflowing. So great is their wickedness. You know, here, the message after that would usher in the kingdom is it's time to prepare for war. It says, let the warriors come down. Rouse the warriors. See, this is what we've come here today to do. Yes, we came to connect with the cross. Yes, we came to give God our first fruits. But we came to rouse for war today. We came to mobilize as the people of God, the family of God, the army of God, to march out those doors as we leave here and to go into our marketplaces, into our schools, back to our families, and tell them that there is a cosmic war at hand and to come and join God's kingdom. You know, it's very interesting that it says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. We know from Isaiah that he said the opposite about 400 years earlier. He said, no, 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 the, the, the sword is going to become a plowshare and the spear is going to become a pruning hook. 
What does this tell us? Are they contradicting each other? Or does this give us an incredible message? See, Isaiah was letting us know that this new kingdom that was to come, it would be a, a different type of kingdom. It wouldn't be a physical nation. Now it would be a spiritual nation. They wouldn't be training for physical war anymore. Instead, they would be having a harvest. And we see that first harvest of the fruits of the kingdom of God happened there the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. But what is then Joel saying? He's going, okay, yes, this is going to be a spiritual kingdom. And we're going to have a harvest of souls. But make your efforts clear that we are still at war. It may be a spiritual war, but a war nonetheless it is. It says in 1 Kings chapter 20, the king of Israel replied, tell him who puts his armor on, he should not boast like one who takes it off. You know, we have not come here in a time of peace. We've come here in a time of spiritual war. I've got to ask you, do you have your full armor on this morning? Are you roused to go and fight for God? Are you prepared for war? You know, I love, it says, let the weakling say, I am strong. You know, I'll never forget when we were preparing to go from Las Vegas to San Francisco. And, uh, you know, Sarah and I had such a great time in Las Vegas. We saw the church go from the 14 people we started with to almost 60 in about 15 months. And so it was awesome to see what God did. So we were like, we were fired up. And I'll never forget the first time I talked to Cindy Oaks, who was the shepherdess in training at that time in San Francisco. I was telling her all my galactic plans and we're going to get all the bay and all this stuff. And I remember Cindy Oaks just stopped me. She was, hold on, bro. Like, we're not strong here. We're very weak here. And I, I know you're excited, but we're, but we're very weak. And I told her, sis, you're a lot stronger than you think. And it was incredible to get there and see Cindy Oaks and Gary get strong. And all those plans to get regions all around the bay. We did those things, but it took the weak saying they were strong. Let's turn to each other on the right and left and let's say, bro, sis, you're strong. Let's say it together as a family on the count of three. One, two, three. We're strong. God, God wants to strengthen you today. He wants you to walk out of here feeling strong in him. Let the weakling say I'm strong. You know, I, I believe that many of us feel like we need to get strong. Yeah. And you may be going, okay, that's awesome. Thank you for having us say this to each other. That was a cool moment. I can't say I feel any different. How do I get strong? Well, I'm glad you asked. And, and the answer is very simple. It's in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. I'll just read it to you. But write it down. It says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. This is what the Bible says. It's a foolproof plan to get strong. You could be strong tonight. You could be strong right now. It takes one decision. One radical decision to get fully committed to God. Now, here's the thing about this. We believe this and we don't believe it. Like, we believe in a sense that if I wanted to improve my basketball game, which, you know, it's pretty strong at this point, to be honest with you. But if I wanted to improve my basketball game, what would I need to do? Do I need to go home or do I need to go to the ball court? No, 
I need to get on the court and start practicing my free throws. I need to start practicing my three-pointers, and I need to start praying for miracles that I could one day dunk, right? But I, I, I need to put in the work. I need to get committed if I want to get strong in that area. So we believe this in, in every area of life for the most part. But for some reason, I don't know. I don't know what it is. But for some reason, when it comes to Christianity, we want this crawl, walk, run approach. We want this, no, I, I, I can't get strong. I, I'm weak, and then maybe I'll get a little less weak, and then I'll get a little less weak the next week after that. And then maybe three years, four years, five years from now, if all goes well and the Holy Spirit really grabs hold of me, <laughs> then I will get strong. But what do you expect from me? No, this is where the Bible starts at Christianity. You get fully committed. And then watch how God strengthens you. Now, isn't that where you started, actually? I, I feel quite confident that everybody who became a disciple in this church, all, all that happened, I, I don't think you signed up for a six-month course or anything like that. Uh, I don't think there was any type of uh, program to it. Somebody just sat down with the Bible. That person may have known a good amount of what they're doing. They may have had very little idea what they're doing. But they had the Bible. And they weren't just trying to communicate theology to you. They read simple passages with simple applications and called you to do it. And looked at you like they actually expected you to do it because somebody looked at them, whether it be six months or a year or six years before or 26 years before, and did the same. And what happened? You're okay, this is what the Bible says. I got to do it. And amazing strength came into your life. You were able to break off relationships? No problem. I'll never forget one time uh, way back in the South region when we were here. We're studying the Bible with this, this Russian young man who is from Russia, and he came over, and uh, we started studying with him at Old Stony Brook over there in Long Beach, and uh, we, we, we looked at him, we said, hey, you've got to be willing to break off this relationship with this girl. It's a sinful relationship. You can't live like that. And he goes, for Jesus, I drop her like hot rock. <laughs> He dropped her like a hot rock. He got baptized, and his mom got baptized, too. But it was just, man, the strength came in for just simply calling him to make the Bible a standard and get fully committed. What could happen with you today? I got to be honest. I, I mean, you get a really good view up here. And the face does reflect what's happening in the soul. And I'm just your brother. I'm just, I got my own set of problems, you know. But I'm just telling you, some of us need to get strong. And it can happen right now. If you're willing to make a decision to get fully committed like you did in the beginning. You know, I thought the winter workshop was incredible. I had an amazing time. I, I was just so inspired. But I want to be honest, I want to keep it real with you. I was a little saddened to see that the Sunday attendance was only about 853 disciples from Los Angeles. We had disciples from San Francisco. We had some disciples from Fresno and Sacramento there, and that was awesome. But we have about 900 disciples in the church here. And to have only 853 and probably some guests in that, so probably about 800 disciples, that a, a hundred of our brothers and sisters did not find it worth their time on a Sunday morning to come and be a part of the winter workshop, the year of miracles, it hit my heart. I hope it hits your heart. And I hope that if maybe some of us were one of those 100 people, that today you would make a decision 
to get fully committed and watch God strengthen you. You know, I do appreciate our, our, our Good News Network. And I do appreciate Kip's emails that he sends out. And on the Good News Network, there's an incredible account of a, a lady in India named Chandra who's 105 years old. I'm not even going to ask, is there anybody 105 here? There's nobody that age here. 105 years old and travels two hours to get to service. Two hours on buses and has people even carry her the last leg of the way there. But she's at the services and she's strong, even at 105, because she's committed. You know, I, I also want to just lift up a, a, a son and daughter in the faith to Sarah and I, and that's Adam and Lauren Cepeda. Yeah. And I was so proud of them for the communion that they did last Sunday. Yeah. It was honestly one of the greatest communions I've ever heard. And what I appreciated about it was that Adam and Lauren, when they left Los Angeles you know, less than a couple years ago, they were really not doing well spiritually. They're very weak spiritually. They could have fallen away. And when they came up, you know, we, we loved them. We did our best to wrap our arms around them. But part of that experience was me calling them to take responsibility for where they were at spiritually. Because it's very easy to become a victim in this life. And you know what they say, when you're pointing your finger at other people, there's how many fingers pointed back at you? A lot more than the one <laughs> finger you're pointing at other people. And they had to take responsibility for where they were at. Even though things happened to them, maybe people sinned against them, they, they saw, well, okay, I allowed myself to stop giving God my best. I allowed myself to stop seeking and saving the lost, the very reason why Jesus came to the earth. I allowed myself to not be discipled anymore. I allowed myself to get embittered. I allowed myself to go to these places, and that is about nobody else but me. Wow. And when Adam and Lauren connected with that, wow, the healing came into their life in an incredible way. And I appreciated them just putting that forth with great brokenness and humility. And I so was inspired to see the Zepedas get back up. You know, one of the hardest things to do in life is get back up. You know, one of my favorite series of movies is the Rocky series. Because really what Rocky's all about is getting back up. And you have uh, Rocky 1. If you've never seen it, you got to watch these. Not all at one time. Because you need to be in Bible studies. But over a good portion of time, watch them. But Rocky I is so awesome because he's kind of like the, the neighborhood nobody who gets a chance to fight for the heavyweight championship. Because Apollo Creed, his, the number one contender, has to drop out. And they have to find some way to spin this. And they do, let's do a charity event and give a, a, a neighborhood nobody a chance at the title. And Rocky gets a chance. And they didn't give him that he'd make it out of the first two or three rounds. But he goes the, almost the distance with Apollo Creed. And that was the greatest victory in itself. Rocky II, now Apollo Creed is quite resentful because this nobody took him the distance. And he had to come back and fight him again just to show the world that this was a fluke. He comes back, and Rocky not only fights him again, but he beats him and becomes the heavyweight champion of the world. But possibly my favorite of all the series is Rocky III. Because now Rocky, he's a millionaire. He's got a Ferrari. He, you know, uh, he, he, he's got an incredible wife. He's got a, a, a little boy. He's got a dog. He's got a mansion. He's got all this stuff. And he eventually starts to get comfortable. And he announces that he's going to retire. And right when he's about to retire, a guy named Clubber Lang. I mean, I think of all the names on the planet, somebody named Clubber Lang is probably the last guy I'd like to fight. 
But a guy named Clubber Lang challenges him in front of his wife. And so Rocky can't help but take the challenge. But Rocky's mentor and his coach, Mick, doesn't want anything to do with it. Because he knows that Clubber Lang is a killer. And you got this great scene that Mick storms off and he goes back to their mansion. He's packing up to leave for a permanent vacation. And Rocky catches up with him and he says, why are you doing this? He goes, because you can't win, Rock. This guy will kill you to death inside three rounds. He goes, you're crazy. He goes, ah, what else is new? He's just another fighter. No, he ain't just another fighter. This guy was a wrecking machine. You ain't been hungry. You haven't been hungry since you won that belt. He goes, oh, what are you talking about? I've had 10 title defenses. He goes, that was easy. He goes, what do you mean easy? He goes, they was handpicked. And then he realized, he goes, handpicked. Were they setups? He goes, nah, they weren't setups. They was good fighters, but they wasn't killers like this guy. He'll knock you into tomorrow, Rock. Then he goes, geez, Mick, what do you think? I got nothing left? He goes, well, kid, because the beating you took from Apollo should have killed you, and it didn't. It was my job to keep you winning and keep you healthy. And he goes, you don't think I got nothing left, huh? He goes, well, Rock, let's put it this way. Three years ago, you were supernatural. You was hard and nasty. You had this cast iron jaw. But the worst thing happened to you that could happen to a fighter. You got civilized. And I wonder if some of us have gotten civilized. It's the worst thing that could happen to a disciple. Is that you just get civilized. You know, he talks Mick into coaching him. You know what? He doesn't take the training very seriously. He's kind of lost his heart and all. He gets in the ring with Clubber Lang, and he gets knocked out brutally in two rounds. Wow. Wow. But then, of all people, who comes back to get his heart back with him? Apollo Creed. Wow. Apollo Creed says, hey, you're going to come train our way. You're coming to L.A. and training. Yeah. He brings him to L.A., and he's going to teach him the sweet science of boxing. But even though Rocky is he's training in this and that, his heart's not there. And there's this scene where Apollo Creed is, is sparring with him, and he's going, come on, it, it's, it's, it's fight day. It's Clubber Lang. He's going to kill you. All right, Rock, you got to duck and dodge. You got to do this. And, you know, he's just not giving his heart to it. And he goes, what's wrong with you, Rock? What's wrong with you? This guy's going to put you in the hospital for five weeks this time. He goes, tomorrow. Tomorrow. He goes, there is no tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. See, it's apocalypse now. There is no tomorrow. Today is the day to make a decision to get totally committed and then watch God strengthen you in an incredible way. Rocky gets committed. He gets his heart back. And he gets the title back as well. You know, if we keep reading this passage in verse 14, it says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the Lord is near. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Maybe you're in the valley of decision today. Don't worry. God's near you. If you just make a decision that now is the harvest, now is the day of salvation, now is the day to get fully committed, God will strengthen you in incredible way. I got a challenge for you. Make a decision. If you're studying the Bible, I got a challenge for you too. Make a decision. Make a decision to get out of the valley, become a soul out disciple and help us turn this city upside down for Jesus Christ. My second point for you today, only the harvesters will be harvested. 
Let's turn over here to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21 and verse 33. Give me an amen when you're there. Amen. Amen. I'll give you another 10 seconds. <laughs> Matthew 21 and verse 33. Jesus says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He dug a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower around it. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and they treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he'll rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him a share of crops at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in his eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and will be given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Only the harvesters will be harvested. You know, this parable obviously has an incredible spiritual meaning. The landowner is God. The vineyard is his kingdom. The farmers are God's people that he's entrusted his kingdom to. The fruit is the souls of his would-be children, sons and daughters that he wants us, that he expects us to bring into his kingdom. It says God gave him the land. He then sends servants. These are the prophets. He sent prophets back to him, tell him, guys, repent. Be the people of God. Do the will of God. They, they killed the prophets. They stoned the prophets. Then he goes, I'm going to send more prophets to them. They stoned them too. Then finally God goes, okay, I know how I'm going to capture their heart. I'm going to send my son. And you know what we did to him? We killed him also. And Jesus kind of sets them up really good. He goes, what do you think will happen when the landowner comes back? They're, they're going to bring those wretches to a wretched end. And he's going to give it to somebody who will produce the fruit. He goes, have you never had a quiet time? I'm talking about you. And he goes, therefore, the kingdom's going to be taken from them. And it'll be given to a people who will do it who will produce the fruit. Do you understand that God expects us to evangelize the world? That this is, this, is, this is not an option. It's not a good idea. It's not a mission statement. It's not a theme. It's not a cool thing. It's something that God expects us to do it. That's why it takes a generation to get it done, because it's going to keep you faithful over your whole life. The way to make it to heaven is to... Finish the job. And only those who sign up and go, here am I, send me. I'll put my hand to the plow and I'll never look back. And I'll keep going until the job's done. They're only the ones fit for service in the kingdom of heaven. I think we, we, we've got to make sure we think of the right way. Sometimes we can let the religious world start to creep into how we think about the church. The religious world has a clergy and a laity ecclesiastical structure of worship. That means that I'm clergy, which means that I'm a clerk. I work for the church. And somebody who doesn't, they're lady, they're common people. 
and that there's a very clear distinction between the two. That's not what we believe in God's church. We believe that we are all called to the same standard of commitment and that we would all be fishers of men as a true disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, in the religious world, they have a Laity Sunday. It's in the third week of October. This is just one day a week where they ask their members to kind of get involved in the campaign. But that's not what we believe. We believe that every Sunday is time for us to roll up our sleeves and help to bring in the harvest to be the harvesters because one day we will then be harvested by our God. You know, it says in Acts 20, verse 28, be shepherds of God's church, which he bought with his own blood. Guys, there's no volunteers in the kingdom. You were bought at a price. The blood that bought your salvation is more precious than the blood that runs through our veins. And everybody's called to be a true harvester of the kingdom. You know, there's a lot for us to do. We want to plant 30 churches this year. 30 churches. We want to plant Bangkok, Thailand. You know, my dear brother, somebody who we've been building a church with for seven years in San Francisco, the, the Sarkodies are going back to Ghana to plant the church there. We're going to plant churches all over the world. But it's going to take each one of us saying that I will be a harvester. You know, Paul said at the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He didn't say, like, I fought a couple rounds of the good fight. He didn't say, you know, I, I made it the first leg of the race. And then I cheered for those who kept going. No, he says, I kept the faith, which means he completed the task. That is keeping the faith. I think we, we've got to be just so grateful for Kip and Elena McKean. These are people, man, it's a rocky story. Been knocked down, got back up, no matter what, Portland, L.A., all over, whatever it takes. Because I know Kip's heart. He goes, I want to finish the race and say I kept the faith that we got the job done in our generation. You know, I'm so fired up about what God's done these last several weeks here in L.A. We've seen in 22 days, we've had 30 additions already. In 22 days, we're on pace to do about 450 additions this year. That's twice as many as last year. I mean, God is working. It's going to take all of us joining in the efforts. You know, I got one final point for you today. And it comes from Psalm 126. Psalm 126. In verse 1, it says, When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion... We were like men and women who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter. Our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams of the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. And the church said, Amen. My final point for you today is a harvest of tears. We know this as one of the songs of the ascent. This is what our ancient brothers and sisters would have sung to each other as they went back up to Jerusalem with the dream of rebuilding the kingdom of God. This is who we are as a people. This is who we are as a nation. We are the dreamers. 
who believe that even in this generation, even with all the darkness that has destroyed our society, that has destroyed our very families, that has even broken down our lives, that we can escape this corrupt generation, that we can restore the ancient order of what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus, and that we can win the world in this generation. That's who we believe. This is what our life's about. It's a harvest of tears. The depiction is, is these workers go out, these tenants go out sowing seed. And as they scatter those seed, their tears are falling. Bringing life to those seeds and making it sprout. Wow. And it says those who go out sowing in tears. Because they've seen what has happened in this world. They say, I've got to do something about it. Those people will come back with sheaves. Rejoicing at what God's done in their life. And through their life. And through their efforts. And through their ministry. And through their church. And that's who we are. It's a harvest of tears. You know, when Sarah and I went to Las Vegas, we took the whole team to Hoover Dam. And many of the workers died building that dam, dozens and dozens of them. And there was a monument built to commemorate their sacrifice. And you could go there, there's this incredible figure like this with this, this, these, this man holding up the dam. And under it, it says, we died to make the desert bloom. And we told that mission team that that would be us that we were going to lay down our lives in Sin City so that it could get the life-giving water of God's true kingdom, his church, and his scriptures. And they laid down their lives, and it bloomed in an incredible way. You know, we had to cancel the Mount Hollywood staff meeting because we've had so much rain lately. And Sarah and I got down here, and we're like... I've just never seen it rain this much in all the years I've lived in California. And I was having a, a, a talk with Kip, and he told me about something that I'd never heard of before. It's called atmospheric rivers. And I, I was like, yeah, yeah, atmospheric rivers. <laughs> because, bro, let me tell you about them. And it's so incredible. That there are literally rivers in the heavens that are, are shaped like a river, like this. And they say that they have so much water, it's about 25 times the amount of the Mississippi River. And that is what has been dumped on California to begin our year. And it made me think... Not by chance, but by the will of God, it's right when we had Operation Jerusalem. That God is literally raining down life-giving water to have a harvest here in California. And we're seeing it bloom in an amazing way. But I like to believe that those heavenly rivers are the tears of God for where things are at. Let us shed our tears as well, and we'll have a harvest. Let's close out here in James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And we'll pick it up in verse 7. It says, Be patient then, brothers. Until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop. And how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient. Stand firm. Because the Lord's coming is near. Here it says that God is just a farmer waiting for that valuable crop. How long has he been waiting? Well, it says in Galatians 3 that we who belong to Christ are the seed of Abraham. That these seeds were 
planted even all the way back in the time of him. And God's just been waiting for those seeds to develop, for the task to be done. And he's going to one day open the floodgates and that, that angel is going to come out of the church, out of the temple, and he's going to look back up to the heavens and he's going to go, Jesus, swing the sickle for the harvest is ripe and it's time to harvest the earth. But until that day, it's time to go and seek and save a lost world. I love you guys very much. And to God be all the glory.